what makes a city on one hand it is clear that people make a city the way we live the things we do the languages we speak the food we eat all the things we call culture at the same time our streets and buildings aren't just functional constructions without meaning or impact embedded within the walls of our cities traveling through the by lanes in the very air we breathe is a deep history that shapes our culture and our cities we may be unaware of this history and yet it shapes us in so many unseen ways Delhi is a particularly fascinating city in this regard because it is not just one city but many there have been seven cities of delhi perhaps even 14 depending on which source you believe these separate cities of delhi are cities that have stood apart but that have also been superimposed like layers forming a three dimensional tapestry one on top of the other these different cities have carried with them the dna of various civilizations delhi is not just an indian city but also a turkish city also a persian city also a british city and this blend of influences from across the world into one organic complex beast makes delhi also a quintessentially Indian city because what is India if not a delightful khichdi that contains all of the world I am an occasional visitor to Delhi and driving through these streets of relatively recent vintage I often see these old monuments all around me these repositories of our past and I wonder if these walls could speak what stories would they tell Welcome to the scene and the unseen Our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene and the unseen. My guest today is Rana Safi, author of a trilogy titled "Where Stones Speak." In her books, Rana takes an affectionate look at our architecture and places it in the context of the history of the many Delhi's. And indeed, it is these many Delhi's, as opposed to the one or two most of us know of, which we call Old Delhi and New Delhi, that makes this place so fascinating. Before we begin our conversation, though, let's take a quick commercial break. If you enjoy listening to the scene on the unseen you can play a part in keeping the show alive the scene on the unseen has been a labor of love for me i've enjoyed putting together many stimulating conversations expanding my brain and my universe and hopefully yours as well but while the work has been its own reward i don't actually make much money off the show although the scene on the unseen has great numbers advertisers haven't really woken up to the insane engagement level of podcast i do many many hours of deep research for each episode besides all the logistics of producing the show myself scheduling guests booking studios paying technicians the travel and so on so well i'm trying a new way of keeping this thing going and that involves you my proposition for you is this for every episode of the seen and the unseen that you enjoy buy me a cup of coffee or even a lavish lunch whatever you feel it's worth you can do this by heading over to seenunseen.in/support and contributing an amount of your choice this is not a subscription the scene and the unseen will continue to be free on all podcast apps and at seenunseen.in this is just a gesture of appreciation help keep the thing going seenunseen.in/support rana welcome to the scene and the unseen thank you so much for inviting me Rana before we uh, begin uh, talking about your fascinating uh, books and the, and the work that you've done tell me a little bit about yourself are you a delhi person to begin with i am delhi's adopted daughter i <laughs> never lived in delhi i was brought up in lucknow i belong to aligarh i did my schooling in lucknow and then college in aligarh and after that after i got married we lived in uh, various cities all over the country as far as cochin and pune and then we went to the middle east and it was during one of my trips from uh, the middle east to delhi that something pulled me to it and my daughter was living here working here and that's the first time i really came to delhi not as a point of transit but as a visitor to delhi and uh, i went to mehroli on a heritage walk and uh, that's when something inside me urged me to write about it to document the history of delhi and were you someone who is generally otherwise into the history of cities like when you uh, lived in all these different cities you know did architecture draw you and did you notice these things i mean the reason i ask is uh, this almost naive question is because when it comes to myself 
a lot of the city around me wherever i am almost becomes invisible it's it's normalized so i'm in my own cocoon i could be you know at a cafe or at home or in my car and i don't notice stuff around me so have you always been a noticer or did that start happening after you got interested in Now, architecture has always fascinated me i did my masters in history and though i specialized in economic history because i was i was studying in aligarh muslim university uh, but uh, after i finished my masters and even before uh, it was always monuments which fascinated me though i never at that point of time ever thought i would be working on it so seriously and i still remember i think i was about 14 or 15 years old when i went to fatehpur sikri and the mystique of that city a city which was so alive yet so dead with nobody living there you know that city pulled me to it and uh, at that time i didn't know what it was but i could feel something that there are some you know the there is a saying in urdu ke khandar bata rahe hain ke mara shandar thi so that is what has always spoken to me whenever i've been to these monuments people see them as ruins i see them as places where people lived and laughed and live uh, and loved and that each of them has a story today of course there's nobody to tell the story so i just took it upon myself and <laughs> maybe it was a bit ambitious or whatever you can call it but i just thought that uh, these stories through the books that have been written on them especially delhi is very well documented so i went to the 18th 19th century urdu books and chronicles and i started documenting from there then all the gazettes and uh, all the books that have been written under the SI the archaeological reports all of them document uh, delhi's monuments during the 19th and the 20th century so i used all of them and from there i unraveled the history of most of uh, delhi's monument i think in my trilogy by now i must have covered at least 3 to 400 monuments wow Yeah. <laughs> and and monuments not just in in the terms of covering the monuments but placing them in the context of a history yes, and yes. all of that which also really fascinated are you someone who's always been into history in that sense yes history has always been my subject and i was not after my masters i've been teaching history also i taught it at a school level in the senior school 8th 9th and 10th i taught it in uh, jamshedpur then i taught it when i was in the middle east so i've been in touch with history and teaching history and there's this old cliche that goes like for example when people listen to some of the episodes i've done with historians like uh, you know our mutual friend manu and ira and parvati and so on and people often say that they make history so interesting and in school it was so boring our teachers taught it so badly and now i'm sitting with someone who actually taught history <laughs> in school so uh, what was your approach towards uh, sort of then teaching history like I had wonderful teachers uh, of history. So when I taught history, uh, I tried to take it away from just the you know the dates. Most students are just told you know learn this date, learn that. I tried to analyze it, which is what the way I was taught that history is all about. analyzing the events that happened and why they happened not just mugging up the dates so i would of course in school i would give them the dates and i would give them the charts and i would give them these you know how to learn them but i would also explain that, that what is so fascinating and interesting about the dates and then that makes it come life for the student and then they remember it so i remember a student telling me that uh, history was never my subject i taught him in class 8 and 6th and 7th he had already been doing it and he said uh, that history was never my subject but now i think i'm going to take it up further and you possibly uh, you know uh, doing the same service to your writings today did it help while you you were doing a historical research did it sort of help that you could read multiple languages very well like you know you've even got a book of translated works yes. from urdu to english and did more sources therefore come alive for you because you could read urdu both? is uh, the language that i read and uh, that also is an interesting journey because urdu also i had learned as a child and then you know it big my knowledge was very rusty i relearned it because when i decided to start writing and i start i have this forum called shire running on uh, twitter it's still running after 10 years almost and uh, in that once i started that i started re- learning urdu to understand what urdu poetry is all about not just you know writing it in roman but what are the symbols what is the thought behind the poet's mind and as i went deeper and deeper into it then obviously you need to know urdu so i learned urdu and uh, relearned i should say a language which i had forgotten and uh, 
that then helped me when I shifted to history. And uh, that has been a big asset to me because, as I said, one of the two very definitive books which have been written on Delhi, one was in Urdu called Asaru Sanadid, which I translated. Another is a three-volume book by Bashiruddin Ahmad, written in uh, 1917 or so, called uh, Darul Hukumat, Delhi Darul Hukumat. So uh, that is the book which I have used as a base because they describe a Delhi which is no longer there. A lot of, most of the monuments have been uh, destroyed or have been, are in ruins or whatever it is. So I use that as a base to take the stories, some anecdotes from there, then do my own research and then place it that, okay, something was here th at that time, where has it gone and why has it disappeared? Or what was the way that people saw it in, say, in the event Sir Sayyid writes, he's writing it at the time of the Empire. So when he saw the Red Fort, he saw it as a working, living palace. We see it today just as a tourist place. So then Bashiruddin Ahmad describes it under the British. And he says that, you know, the room, there's one room, uh, the Khwabga. And he says the British have made this into a Mughal room where you can come and savor the, the saying delights of being a Mughal. So you have uh, the same uh, sitting arrangement and Shah Jahan's saber kept there and, you know, the Bahadur Shah's hukka kept there. So you come and feel like a king. So these things made it very fascinating for me. And that is why in my book, uh, the last book that's come out, Shah Jahanabad, The Living City, I have not only described the ruins, I have also described as what it would have been like, taking material from these books, which are trying to show that. And also, I translated another couple of books which talk about the culture and the people of those uh, days. So I took from all these books to try and recreate a Delhi which existed in those days. And, and how was the experience that, okay, you go to this monument and it's just an empty tourist place and you look around and the first time you're seeing it as an outsider, you're a tourist. And then you read a book like this, which, you know, makes it much richer and, uh, you know, brings that era alive. And then you go back to that place and, and, you know, does the whole city start meaning different things to you? So normally when I go to my first visit, I don't read much about it except whatever I know because I want that first impression to be my impression. And I photograph everything, I videograph it so that, you know, I have uh, everything there that uh, then I come back and then I read about it. And then when I read, I look at my photographs and see, okay, this, 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 this is what, you know, sometimes I've taken a photograph which may not have meant anything at that time. But when I come back and read about it, then I realize, okay, this is what they are talking about. Then I go back. And then that is my final research of placing it. And uh, like in the case of Shah Jahanabad, because that and Mehroli also before that. Shah Jahanabad is where people are staying. Then I go and talk to the local people. And in Shah Jahanabad, I've done a lot of interviews, which I have included, where... Uh, what do the people who are living there think about it? So in so many cases, they said that, you know, old people think of old Delhi only as a food capital or they think of it as a place where, uh, you know, it is unsafe. So how do the residents who are living there for, say, 200, 300 years, some of them who came with Shah Jahan, some who came shortly after that, how do they see their heritage and how are they trying to preserve it? So I've tried to collect that also because I wanted to put all that in one place as a record, document that. And I, I guess in doing all this, one trap you've tried to avoid is a trap that writers may have of exoticizing the everyday. So you're writing about a place that is very old and has this rich history. And, you know, there is a trap of reading too much into it and how you avoided sidestep that, of course, is by taking all these interviews and, you know, speaking to kind of local people there. Uh, you know, do you often find that people who are actually living uh, in the midst of history, as it were, that they are kind of unaware of all uh, that has happened around them. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? See, in Delhi, the problem is that we saw two exodus, especially in uh, in Shah Jahanabad, we saw an exodus in 1857. There was displacement. And then again, when they did come back, these people had lost their inheritance and lived a different life from what they had lived under the Mughals. But the whole of Delhi saw displacement and a transfer of population in 1947. So when you go to many places in Delhi, there used to be 
say about uh, 20, 30 years ago, there was no sense of association of people who had say, migrated from Pakistan. For them, this was just a place where they had come and they were trying to make a living. But today's generation has grown up with these monuments. So the school children, for them, it is something that is a part of their heritage. And they are no longer longing for what they've left behind. Because they've seen only this, that that's what they've grown up in. So for them, that association is also a very important thing. So in, when I talk to them, I in Shah Jahanabad, the families that I talk to have been living there forever. So since Shah Jahanabad was made, or maybe, you know, they're a sixth generation or seventh generation, th- fourth generation, fifth generation. For, so for them, of course, it is something that is theirs. But in say in uh, when I did a book called The Forgotten Cities of Delhi, now where we are sitting in Hoskhas, this was the second city of Delhi city made by Alauddin Khilji. Nothing of the original city remains except one or two monuments like the Chor Minar and the Eidgah that is here. The people who are living here have no memory of the past. So for them, everything, they are probably just, you know, going past and wondering what is this strange looking monument. They don't know it. But if you go to a place where people have always lived and lived with it, they know the history of it. Like say somebody in Shah Jahanabad would know what Java Masjid is all about. But somebody living in uh, Hus Khas wouldn't know that there is a Neeli Masjid here, which was built by a woman. And it's a functioning mosque even today. Not, of course, as big, but still a very pretty mosque. But I think they would just bypass it. They wouldn't, you know, care about it. Because it's not something which is something that they've grown up with. Children may, are now interested. Like oh, Chor Minar is something that is very fascinating because you can see holes and you have these stories. It's alleged that... Uh, because uh, Alauddin Khilji was fighting the Mongol menace and he was a very trying to be, you know, discipline his army and take on it. So, of course, he had a lot of uh, measures in place, some of them which were extremely extreme. And one of them was that anybody caught, you know, stealing or anybody even in weights and measures or anything like that, then they could have all kinds of extreme punishments, including cutting of hands and cutting of heads. And this Chor Minar is said to be the place where the heads would be hanged. So this is a very macabre and uh, interesting monument. So I think this is something maybe people living around it may be fascinated by. I have no idea. But whenever I've come here, uh, you know, like Firosha Kotla uh, is said to be the city. That is the famous city of the Jids. It's the fifth city of Delhi, Firuzabad. And uh, when you go there, you'll find lots of people on a Thursday coming from uh, Old Delhi. But uh, the first time I went there and I told, I had come from Dubai and I took a taxi and I asked my driver to take me to Firosha Kotla. He took me to the stadium. And I said, no, this is not this. And he said, no, this is this. This is Anil Kumble had 10 wickets. <laughs> so I said, no, there is another old uh, monument where uh, there, a king used to have a, a castle there. So he said, Achha, let us look for it. So, you know, like people living in Delhi, Think of Hiroshima Kotla, of course that stadium has been, I think, renamed now, but they think of it only as a stadium where Anil Kumble took 10 wickets. They don't remember that this is the fifth city of Delhi, this is where uh, Hiroshima ruled from. But on a Thursday, you'll find that people of old Delhi, they come there in, you know, in, I think in hundreds or thousands or whatever, they come there for their mannats that they make to the jinns. And they'll come with pots of biryanis and zarda, which they distribute because their mannats have been or their vows have been fulfilled. So it speaks differently to different people. My own driver, I asked him once, I said, you know, like, uh, I have access because uh, whenever I go there, sometimes I tell him, I said, you know, I'll be there for three, four hours and I can buy you a ticket. Would you like to come in? And he says, khandro mein kya rakha hai, madam? <laughs> so he can never figure out why am I so fascinated by these ruins and why do I spend so much time in there. But uh, on a Thursday, uh, Firosha Kotla is just something else again. No, and it just struck me, I recorded yesterday with uh, Madhavi Menon, who's written the book Infinite Variety, The History of Desire in India, and she was telling me about the Jamali Kamali um, huh. uh, tomb, which you also mentioned in your first book, Where Stones Speak. And it's so fascinating to me that that's, uh, you know, known as a gay Taj Mahal. And it's, you know, there's this whole history of how Jamali and Kamali might have been same-sex lovers, so we don't know, and how the tomb has these characteristics of, you know, both a feminine flat surface on top and a sort of dome inside, which is, uh, you know, and so these deeper resonance 
differences that they carry are they sort of popularly known or do you think See, that is starting uh, to happen jamali was a, S- a sufi saint and he was a po- poet he wrote uh, some very beautiful poetry and uh, he was the son in law of another very famous saint sarwadi saint who is also buried nearby and uh, the identity of the second person is not known so all these histories and all these legends have come much after him none of the contemporary histories mention anything about a kamali okay so these names like when you go to uh, sultan razia's grave they'll tell you razia shahzia ki grave hai because the words rhyme so there are two graves there so one is razia one is shahzia raji chaji that is what it's called the sisters so kamali rhymes with jamali but none of the uh, contemporary historians talk of a kamali or a relationship there's been a book recently i think about 4 or 5 years ago there was a book on it which i did read uh, on that and uh, we have no idea what <laughs> the relationship actually was but uh, and he lived inside that you so most of these tombs are places where the saints lived and then they were buried inside that so it could possibly have been a relationship between the two of them or he may have just been a disciple because you do have cases of disciples and the relation between the pir and murshid jaise hazrat nizamuddin or hazrat amir khusro ka tha it was very very close so it could be that also who were also according to madhavi uh, possibly same sex lovers could be that's what i'm saying i yeah. don't say it wasn't that but what i'm just saying is that it has not been mentioned by anybody ha huh, so it could be like padmavat that it's just something that huh. came up later and so you and have so. and you have a lot of romantic stories which come up like for example arazia now the story of her when yesterday also i was talking to somebody and uh, uh, the jamia people had they had called me for a street lecture series so i was talking to them about razia and i said how many of you when you think of razia think of hema malini and almost every hand went up so when we talk of razia sultan made by kamal amrohi and we think of uh, you know hema malini and we think of dharminder but in reality none of the contemporary sources ever mention a relationship between the two the only thing that is mentioned is that she made him his the master of his of tables so one historian says that when he helped her to mount the horse he put his arms under her ha- hands under her arms now it, he would do that the same for any other king wouldn't he had she was wearing male clothes she had taken off her veil in fact so, as you point out in your book she was named sultan razia yes, not razia yes. sultan so he would a, have done the same for iltutmush also but why then don't we talk of a relationship between him and iltutmush then why only a relationship between him and razia so these are ways which stories come up like the padmavat story also that has come up padmavati is an allegory for a sufi story so of course the, the piro murid relationship was very very close and it was something very special so what it exactly is we have no idea but uh, he used to live in that uh, sheikh jamali used to live inside that hujra and when he died he died in gujarat and he had will that he should be buried there and and what i also find fascinating is not just that these stories come up which uh, may not often be true but it's worth then inquiring what is the instinct that leads to these stories being created and propagated and believed like they come up because people what there's something in there that attracts people and they want to believe like there's another very interesting story uh, uh, which you men- mentioned in um, where stone speak which is about the iron pillar and what you pointed out about the iron pillar is that it is definitely iltutmish we now know who got it from udaipuri and then he planted it again so to say but there's also a legend about anangpal having made it in the first place and then there's a legend about how it goes deep into the earth and it rests on the head of a serpent and i mean it's a delightful story yeah. and one then wonders that what's going on here this uh, uh, this mythologizing that is happening and is it in some senses a version of the politics of today where you want to claim a certain piece of history and you want to change history to suit your ends yes and the best way to do it is through stories to through folk stories through retelling of the tale so and this uh, the story that you mentioned about the iron pillar they say that is the reason for the name uh, delhi also because the original name was dhilli or dhillika so they say na killi to dhilli bhai 
تومر بھائی متھین سو دیسے یہ ڈھلی جو ہے یہ وہاں سے آیا ہے اینڈ بیکاز دا عربس کوڈ ناٹ سے ڈھ سو اٹ بیکیم دہلی اینڈ دلی سو دیز آر اسٹوریز وچ آئی جسٹ فیسنیٹ می اینڈ آئی آلویز پٹ دیم ڈاؤن بیکاز آئی فیل دیٹ پیپل شوڈ نو دیٹ دی دس از اے اسٹوری بٹ اٹس اے اسٹوری because as much as the history itself the stories also reveal yes. something because uh-huh. they are just the f- fact uh-huh. that they've survived and uh-huh. they're believed and, and oral fact. stories also because mm-hmm. oral history is again a big source and uh, when i put it down i always make sure that i write that this is a oral history this is a story i have not found any contemporary source to reinforce this but this is there so that you know like it's at least documented that these are stories some of the stories are so delightful and some of the stories also you know they tell you about that age of how did people think give me an example of the stories you like <laughs> So there's this uh, story in one of the books that I've translated, uh, That City of My Heart. Uh, it's that uh, the first book, Adili Ka Akhri Didar. The story is being told. It's written by somebody else, Sayyid Wadi Hassan, but he has a narrator who's called Agai Begum. Now, Agai Begum is lived as a Mughlani. Mughlani were the seamstresses and the ladies in waiting or whatever inside the Red Fort. So she stayed inside the Red Fort. Now, she's telling the story of how things happened when they lived in the, you know, when the Mughal kings were there. And she describes the Phulwalon Ki Ser. Now, Phulwalon Ki Ser is a historical event and it still happens. And uh, when she's describing it, she describes an anecdote which she says that, you know, like... Uh, the bacha would uh, how they would come all the way from uh, the red fort and they would come there and then kis tarah se baagon mein pakwan pakte the and one of the stories is i'm forgetting whether it is hers or it is there's because i translated four stories in that there's another book uh, story there called qila e molla ki jhalke and one of them there's a story of how there was this woman seamstress and uh, her daughter-in-law is finds a stone that uh, paras ka patthar jisko alchemist stone kehte and then of course she goes and then she calls begum uh, zinat mahal and then she comes and by that time the stone has got thrown away so ab uh, you know the, the story is this is definitely not true but she's recorded it so this story i think is in one of the one of these short stories that i translated so it's a very fascinating story that then the story describes now the the part of the alchemist stone may not be true but the way then they describe how begum zinat mahal is coming now she's coming with the pandan with the hook everything comes behind us so the entire story of that then the story of the phul walon ki سیر کے ایک شکور ککڑ والے تھے یو نو ہی ہکا لے کے جاتے تھے دین ہاؤ ہی ووڈ گو ہاؤ ہی ووڈ بی سو ویل ڈریسڈ اینڈ ان کا ہکا جب جاتا تھا اینڈ یو نو دا انٹائر بازار سین اور ہاؤ پیپل آر دا سنگ ان دا ٹوڈے وین وی گو ٹو مہرولی آف کورس دیٹ جھرنا از ان اے ویری بیڈ اسٹیٹ بٹ دے آر ٹاکنگ آف ڈائیونگ کمپٹیشن بینگ ہیلتھ ہے کہ وہاں پہ آم کا باغ ہے اس آم کے باغ میں پکوان پک رہا ہے یو نو دہی بڑے بن رہے ہیں تھنگ لائک دیٹ یو نو اینڈ دا ورائٹیز آف آمس اینڈ آل دیٹ آل دس ڈسکرائبس اندر سے کی گولیاں وچ وی اسٹل ہیو سو اٹس اے کنٹینیوٹی آلسو So it's a history told through stories and it's also stories about history and it's all of these melding together which uh, one of the interesting things which strikes me whenever I read history is that sitting in the present time uh, looking uh, everything around us seems to be filled with certainty so so many of us like the conception of Delhi you know so most people when they think of Delhi they'll think of Latin's Delhi where uh, you know so many of us come or if you think of old delhi you think of shah jahanabad but shah jahanabad is actually the second last delhi in a series of many many delhis and everything changes so fast and all of what we know as reality is both contingent and extremely recent and um, how does it like you know when you're writing about delhi and some of, all these delhis are sort of superimposed on each other how do you de- how did you develop the gaze to be able to you know separate them out So as I said, that has been done according to Bashiruddin Ahmad's book. Uh, 
and uh, sir sayed both of them have clearly demarcated it so and plus you know the historical the saying of that this city was the which city was built by the tughlaqs so you have very clearly demarcated uh, dynasties here so that has never been a problem because those uh, monuments are very easy to date they are all historically documented so that is not a problem uh, it's uh, and uh, most of the tombs that we see today uh, again that was something that i learned from bashiruddin ahmed that when the lodis were ruling here now before that the slave kings or even the khiljis and the tughlaqs they were t- from turkic uh, descent but the lodis were afghans now afghans have a kind of a tribal uh, system where each tribal king is as important as the next so earlier while the they could not have each uh, noble could not have such a lavish tomb the lodis could all have their own tombs the only difference was that the king had an octagonal tomb and the rest of them could have a tomb so bashiruddin ahmed says that there was a thriving business in tombs today like we have flats so there would be tombs ready to sell and to be bought and that the uh, dynasty was overturned by the moguls and some of the tombs got left and that is why maybe they are empty today so you know we think of you know life and death as so sacred and you know like uh, so many of us are superstitious but they were building and selling tombs <laughs> so, well, there won't have been multi-story tomb blocks so where there are apartment blocks, but that's you know. So let's go back to the origins of Delhi, and this is of course disputed, and some of it is even in the territory of mythology, and uh, you know, one is never quite sure whether Indraprastha, which is supposed to be the first form of Delhi, sort of existed here. Now, you point out uh, in one of your books that um, you know every city needs basically three things: Darya, Badal, or Hakim. So expand on this a little bit and then tell me what is the impetus behind sort of the early delis that are coming up what are they how do they come up See the first documented delhi is the tomar delhi of which the uh, surviving uh, monument is suraj kund and they lived in the, on the what is today's uh, mehroli the ridge yeah. so that was a defensive position that they took it wasn't a very big city so they have reservoirs there are remains of the reservoirs over there so it's strategic is uh-huh, it strategic so for yeah. them defense was of the most important thing then when uh, the delhi sultans come and uh, they defeat the chauhans and they start living there they also occupy that same space that same lal kot so there's one more thing i'd like to say many people I've heard them, and I've heard them on TV also say it that Lal Kala, जो है वो तो तोमर ने बनाया था. There are definitely two red forts in Delhi, but the red fort of the Tomars is in Meroli. And that's Lal Kot. <laughs> that's and the Lal, Lal Kot. Is completely and different. This is this used to be called Kala Mubarak. Mm. It was not called Lal Kala. So. अब आज हम लाल कला कहते हैं बट दिस वॉज मेड बाई शाहजहा एंड द तोमर लाल कोट इज इन मेहरोली एंड द डिफरेंस ऑफ ट्वेंटी सिक्स किलोमीटर्स बिटवीन द टू सो दे आर टू सेपरेट सिटीज टू सेपरेट बिल्डिंग्स सो द तोमर लिव इन मेहरोली इन द लाल कोट एंड द डेली सुल्तान केम एंड ऑल्सो ऑक्यूपाइड द सेम स्पेस एंड यू हैव ऑल द डॉक्यूमेंट्स ऑफ मिनाजो सिराज एंड ऑल दोज हु आर टॉकिंग ऑफ क्राउनिंग कॉरोनेशन टेकिंग प्लेस इन साइड दैट एरिया एक्सेट्रा वी हैव डॉक्यूमेंट ऑफ सुल्तान रजिया are being crowned over there also in the qutub complex and they lived very close to that in a qasr e firoza there's a road running there but that is where they live now so the, when we are talking of that and then when uh, the mongols came they attacked all of central asia india is the only place where they were not successful because alauddin khilji took them on head on and then he moves out of lal kot and builds the second city of siri and that's heavily fortified and where is that in current uh, uh, where we are sitting now hoskhas hoskhas yeah, yeah, and uh, ishiad village ishiad village if you go you will see the ruins of the walls and heavily fortified walls uh, over there so you can see that you can see the bastions uh, a lot of it has been uh, and know, he was like incredibly thick walls you talk yes. of how there were these chambers and where you could walk the soldiers could walk in yeah. between and so the change of guard and you had and everything would be preserved uh-huh. and you talk about how you know uh, there there are accounts of black rice being take rice that has turned black but is still perfectly eatable uh, within those chambers so that is how delhi kept the thing and then uh, tughlaq abad when ghasuddin tughlaq made that and then he had to abandon it because of lack of water they did make bawlis inside and now there's this very famous story about ya rahe gujar ya rahe ujar to the, now professor mohammad habib says that uh, you know hazrat zamudin aulia was not so petty as to be cursing like that and there has to be some other reason about it so but this is the popular perception we all say that 
Rasuddin Tughlaq died because of a curse by Hazrat Nizamuddin Olya, which he says is not true because there's nothing that bears, uh, there's nothing in history which says that, you know, there was this kind of enmity between him, them. So, again, these are all stories. And also curses not... don't kill people. But <laughs> <laughs> so, I have uh, documented all that also. I've given, so I've tried to, what I've done is that I've given the popular perception as well as what the historical fact yeah, is. Exactly. So that people can, you know. In fact, you gave some seven, eight versions of the, how the name Delhi came about. Yes. So at one point, I got really confused. What, 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 what's the one that uh, you think is most uh, likely? See, Dhillika was the name that came here. Mm. They say soft soil. Mm-hmm. And the, the same because the so- soil was soft. So it comes from that Dhillika. And then again, because uh, Dha is something that's not in the Arabic language, so it becomes Dili. Uh, Dili is colloquial and Delhi is the uh, court language, the, uh, the used in the literary, the thing register. And now when the, and Hadrat Delhi is what it's called by Hadrat Amir Khusro. And then when the British come, then as per their phonology, because L, which, uh, you know, has to come after H. Sorry, Del E, yes, it has to come before. Uh, they L has to come before go, H. They can't so go, it becomes, yeah. instead of Delhi, it becomes Delhi. Now, this is something that was pointed out to me by Shweb Daniel. Okay. Because he does a lot of work on uh, languages and linguistics. Hmm. So he's the one who told me about this. Why it became Delhi from Delhi. Shout out to show it was quite an insight. And just thinking aloud, it's also so interesting that, you know, we don't just have to look at uh, historical documents or oral history even to figure out what history is. That in the modern times, there are so many ways of doing it. Like in Tony Joseph's book, for example, where you look at genetics or like in this case, we got a clue through language, uh, through linguistics. And it's all of these different sort of sciences and even arts coming together to uh, shine a light on history. What's also kind of interesting to me is that part of what happens as newer Delhi take over older ones and newer rulers take over older ones is that while there is, of course, uh, this syncretism and, uh, you know, your culture is absorbing everything, there's also a lot of violence uh, and, and both going side by side in the sense that, uh, you know, when Kutubuddin Nabak and Iltutmesh and later the Khiljis and when they take over from the Tomars, there's a lot of destruction. They destroy all the old temples and they build the mosque instead. And yet the pillars are actually made from the, like you pointed out, the pillars are those Hindu pillars, so to say. And the artisans would also be the same artisans as sir, one of the historians says, I'm forgetting, I think, uh, one of the sources which I consulted, they said it is possible that it would be the same artisan who built the temple who is now building the mosque. Yeah, and it's all melting together. So, huh. you know, the calligraphy has Hindu motifs you've pointed out. Uh, you know, you've pointed out similarly in the tomb of Iltutmesh how you see this uh, meld of influences. So it's both that destruction is happening and yet the absorption of culture um, is happening. And, uh, you know, later on, we see this replicated in colonial times. You point out in your book about how when the British built the railway lines, uh, they destroyed the tomb of uh, Zebun Nissa, Aurangzeb's daughter, and how Latians Delhi was was actually, uh, you know, a large number of tombs, graves, pavilions, wells and mansions, as you describe it, uh, had to be uh, demolished, sort of they entombed the tombs in a sense under Latians Delhi. One can look back and one can see the changes, but a lot of these changes were also accompanied by this sort of violence. Did that also have sort of social implications which last to this day? So that is the part of the Hakim. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Darya was when uh, Firozabad, the fifth city of Delhi, comes and is settled near on the banks of the Yamna. That's the first city that comes onto the bank of the Yamna because of water needs. And then, the, of course, Deen Pana, which is Purana Kila, and then Shah Jahanabad, they're all on the banks of the Yamna because you, big population, you need water. And uh, the Hakims win them fancies. Now, which ruler doesn't rule by force? I'm talking of a ruler. Then, yeah. I'm not talking of a democracy. I'm talking of a monarchy. Every monarch is uh, by nature cruel. I mean, even uh, by in nature a, forceful. Even in a democracy, a state has a monopoly on violence and uh, that is always implicit. For example, one interesting thing that struck me, which I was also going to ask you about is, uh, for example, how Lal Court is inside Sanjay 1. 
which I presume is named after Sanjay Gandhi, right? Yes. And that also, in a sense, is an act of violence that you're sort of, uh, uh, you know, trying to reclaim a, a piece of the past by erasing it and by putting a contemporary name on it. And there are also these other juxtapositions happening, like you point out in your book, how the remains of the Badaun Gate are at Kila Rai Pithora, which are at the Kutub Golf Club. So it's like, you know, the present takes over the past. But that that's a different matter as far as a sort of... Uh, but anyway, sorry, that's a digression. So the first of all is that whoever, uh, especially the medieval rulers, stamping your authority by the use of religion was always very effective because... And it didn't necessarily mean that those people were using religion as a tool of ruling also. This was just to stamp their authority. So, you know, you dismantle the or you destroy a temple and you build a mosque. You've told the population or your new subjects that, okay, we are the kings here. It's our rule that is going to be uh, perpetuated or our rule that is going to be here now. So that is the first thing. The second thing is that when the rule, the, the Muhammad Ghori's army comes here and when Kutubuddin Nebak starts ruling, apart from the fact the symbolism of stamping their authority by destroying a temple and building a mosque, the second thing is they want to build a mosque in a hurry. Where do they get everything from? So then you have the reuse. So you immediately reuse what you have destroyed and you deface it and you plaster. Originally, the Kuwait Islam pillars were plastered. The plaster has gone away now. Mm -hmm. So that is how you do it. And that is how they've always done it. And if you see, uh, there's this new book that has come out by Richard Eaton, uh, India in the Persian Age. He talks of two journeys and he talks, his book opens with the journey of Mahmood Ghazni coming to uh, Somnath and Rajinder Chola going from the south to Bengal. And he says both the journeys are very similar. And both of the journeys culminate in destroying the temple. But of course, Ghazni destroys the uh, shivling and the idol in Somnath, whereas the Chola kings brings it back and installs it in his kingdom. So these are again stamping their uh, authority via religion. Because he was of the same religion, he brought it and he brought it here, but he did not leave it there. And he does attack it. And so these are, you know, symbolism, which religion is a very big symbol. And that is why it's always been used as a tool of uh, oppression, as a tool of uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like empowerment or sometimes to... Uh, give uh, power also to the people. Like we were talking of stories. One of my favorite stories is a book written by Faratullah Beg called uh, Phulwalon Ki Ser. I talk a lot about Phulwalon Ki Ser because for me that symbolizes what Delhi was in the... Tell me a bit about Phulwalon Ki Ser. Nine, okay, so Phulwalon Ki Ser starts in uh, the 1820s. There's this, uh, the ruler, Bahadur Shah's father, uh, Akbar Shah II. Akbar Shah II and uh, has a son called Mirza Jahan. Jahangir. Mirza Jahangir was uh, very a favorite of the king, obviously, and very impetuous. And he gets into a fight with the British resident. And that is the time when the British resident was ruling Delhi. In fact, he tries to shoot the British resident you yes. pointed out from he the roof. He shoots at him. He calls him a Lulu. Okay, yes. So uh, then, the, of course, the Seton is told that Lulu means pearl and he's giving you a compliment. Of course, you know, Lulu means something else in Urdu and Hindi, which is the language was spoken by then. So but he accepts it. Then he shoots at him and then he's exiled. And, and an orderly dies. So. Ha, ha, orderly dies and he's exiled and sent to Allahabad. And his mother then vows that if he comes back, I will you know, walk all the way to uh, Kutubuddin Bakhtiar Kaki's uh, Darga in Mehroli and offer a chadar there. And then uh, at that time, Akbar Shah says that, okay, if you're going there, then you must offer a chadar or a chadar to the temple of Yogmaya. Yogmaya is uh, Krishinji's sister that got exchanged in the jail. So that has how it starts. And then earlier it would be that on a Thursday, they would offer the chadar onto the yog on Yogmaya and on Friday they would take the chadar to the Darga and that continued and then the pool valon it's called uh, Saire Gulfarosh because the flower vendors also you know scattered flowers all over the way and then even today if you see a lot of floral tribute is paid in any the Urs you have a lot of flowers and a lot of fl floral tribute of the floral chadars and etc etc so uh, my this uh, uh, Faratullah Beg records a uh, 
story which uh, of uh, the singh said sare gule firosha which happened in 1846 or something during the reign of bahadur shah zafar he is of course writing in 60s or 70s and he talks of that time and he says ke that at the time when of course there was some power left with bahadur shah and he talks of it that you know like uh, he is describing it and he says ke that uh, the people come and they pass by zafar mahal which is the palace the summer palace of the moguls and uh, there the balconies where they would come to watch the procession going by and he is asked to come to the dargah and they said the mandir was a day earlier and the next and he says ke main mandir nahi gaya tha to main dargah kaise jaau mere Wow. लोगों को कितना वो दुख पहुंचेगा कि बादशाह मंदिर तो गए नहीं और दरगाह चले गए तो मैं वहां नहीं गया तो मैं यहाँ भी नहीं जाऊंगा सो ही डजेंट गो टू द दरगाह बिकॉज ही हैज नॉट बीन एबल टू गो टू द मंदिर एज ही वॉज नॉट वेल सो फॉर मी दिस इज वॉट डेली वॉज एंड दिस इज वॉट वॉट वी कीप टॉकिंग ऑफ द गंगा जमनी तहजीब और द सिंक्रिटिज्म दिस इज वॉट इट वॉज एंड दैट इज वाई एवरीबडी फॉट the first war of independence and uh, bahadur shah the first banner even whether it was nana sahib or tatya tope or lakshmi bai it was all under his banner and when we uh, this is of course a story which has been written some years later but zahir dehlvi when he is writing dastan e ghadar he is writing it he of course does also write it later on but he was an eye witness to all the things that were happening during the uh, what they, he calls the ghadar and he describes a incident uh, which happened much before 1857 where he says that uh, one day bahadur shah you know like in the morning they would give jharoka darshan and uh, that balcony is still there the jamna was over there in the morning the hindu ladies and the men would come out for their snan and they would do the ganga snan and the other the non hindus and the muslims and all they would come and they would all assemble under the jharoka and they would come and see his face and then go about their daily business sounds like what happens outside amitabh bachan's bungalow in bombay <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, something like that so the, he comes there and he sees that on the bank of the yamuna there are these tents and he asks them who are you and why are you here and he sends somebody there and he finds out that these are the butchers and they've been told by the british that you can no longer stay here because of the uh, work you are doing it's you know spoiling the city and uh, so he calls his uh, there's not much he can do he he cannot overturn the order so he calls his uh, wazir and he says ke mera khema bhi wahi laga do and uh, of course the minute his khema goes there and he goes there and his tent is also pitched next to the uh, butchers the resident the british resident comes running and says huzur what are you doing and he says i have to stay with my people he says after i leave you can do whatever you want but as long as i'm there my i am with my people and he says he uses the, the analogy he says that uh, the flesh can never be separated from the nail के नाखून से गोश्त अलग नहीं हो सकता है एंड ही स्टेज दे सो दैट हैपन एंड देन रही दैल वी से दैट अ फ्यू मंथ्स डाउन द लाइन द घोसीज दैट इज द दूध वाला ना द घोसीज एंड द दूध वाला वुड ऑफकोर्स द बुचर्स वुड हैव बीन मुस्लिम बट द घोसीज एंड द दूध वाला वुड नॉट हैव बीन मुस्लिम ही सेज द सेम थिंग हैपन एंड दे कम एंड दे ऑल्सो कम इन पिश दैट एंड दे एन सेज के दे बीन आस्ट टू लीव द सिटी बिकॉज ऑफ द Uh, that the city, whatever they are doing the work is hampering the beautification of the city or whatever it is that the british are doing so again he says the same thing say mera khema wahi laga do and he goes there and when the british come then he says ke you know you cannot separate me from my people and as long as i am here my people will be with me he says after i go tum eat seat baja dena delhi ki eat seat baja dena lekin jab tak main hu mere log mere sath rahenge so so the this is how he treated his subjects and when uh, zahir dehlvi is writing the title that he gives is, is basha ki uh, raya parwari that how he treated his subjects equal always so you know these uh, and i see no reason not to believe what zahir dehlvi is writing because he would have been an eye witness he was the basha's courtier so he would be going there he was a, a kind of a page so he would be going there every day and he was also his uh, a poet so he would go there with his uh, verse and all that so he would have seen everything that was happening so this is the kind of delhi that there was in the late uh, say in the 1840s 1830s 1840s 1850s till it 1857 
and the tragedy of history is that eventually he did leave the city on the british ne as you can say eat seat laga di like <laughs> you know and that happened and it's also interesting here you know going back to that earlier theme about how stories are propagated and myths are made to suit political purposes that you know i grew up learning in school that uh, bahadur shah zafar was a very uh, you know ineffectual weak sort of ruler hmm. and these sort of statesman like qualities are are just not part of those stories and and it all kind of depends on who's telling those stories and uh, where they have come from how, how how would you tease out issues of reliability because a lot of sources are people who are close to the protagonist some might be writing two centuries after what has happened when you can't be sure whether they'll be correct in fact at uh, for a certain period you point out that most of the sources are turkish or persian persian sources there aren't so many indian sources about the lives of those sultans so how does that exercise happen because if someone's writing a history of something that happened in the 20th or 19th century i guess there are enough sources that you can collect them all and get a very good sense but if you're writing about something that happened in the 12th century or the 11th century so that is also a area of concern that most of the history that were written of the delhi sultans obviously they were in persian and uh, they were translated by eliot and dawson as history of india as told by its historians and as many historians have pointed out they focused only on one aspect of the rulers because they were trying to show that the british are the rulers who've come as saviors of the indians so you have you have a lot of commentaries written on those uh, histories also that this is where they've you know misinterpreted it this is where they've gone wrong so uh, anyone who's a serious uh, student of history goes through the commentaries also to see what is there you go through more than one uh, translation i don't know farsi myself urdu of course i read so farsi i have to go through more than one translation sometimes i have to go and see the translations how they've been used and mentioned by other historians historians whom i rely on and find credible and as far as the heer the helvi is concerned now he ran from pillar to post hiding from the british so his escape is a very very interesting part of the journey it apart from the story of the ghadar itself and he when he is writing it on his deathbed he is living in british india so for him to be praising the king who has been exiled by the british it was an act of bravery <laughs> and it was also an act of resistance so i see no reason why he would be you know like coloring it because that's why i feel that the history that was written either in the 19th century or in the by ordinary people i'm not talking of court histories or in the late 19th century early 20th century there was at that time not that agenda so we are not we don't have a right or a left or a centrist or a you know there's no secular history and liberal history and you know a religious history kind of those angles that are given to us the names that we are given today they are just writing things as they see it and as they perceive it so those histories of course are colored by a little bit of whatever their feelings are but there's much more truth in what they're writing when they're describing the society at least they won't sort of get the basic facts wrong yes. if they're writing yeah. with that kind even of if the facts are not there the actually the ethos that they're describing has to be there because where else do they get it from fair point let's let's take a quick commercial break and talk more about the history of delhi when we come back If you're listening to the seen and the unseen it means you like listening to audio and you're thirsty for knowledge that being the case I'd urge you to check out Storytel the sponsors of this episode Storytel is an audiobook platform that has a massive range of audiobooks from around the world their international collection is stellar but so is a local collection they have a fantastic range of marathi and hindi audiobooks what's more i do a weekly podcast there called the book club with amit varma in which i talk about one book every week giving context giving you a taste of it and so on download that app and listen to my show and as long as storytell sponsors this show within this commercial itself i will recommend an audiobook that i liked on that platform every week my recommendation for this week is everybody lies by sait stephens davidovits in this book stephens davidovits examines data from google facebook wikipedia and various porn sites to see what people tend to search for and to see if this can hold insights into their essential nature after all all through life we are putting on a front signaling and pretending but there is no pretense in what we search for when we are alone online our true selves stand revealed 
It's an eye-opening book and you can listen to it on Storytel. Everybody Lies by Sait Stephens Davidovitz. Download the Storytel app or visit storytel.com. Remember, the Storytel with a single L, storytel.com. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I'm chatting with Rana Safi, the outstanding historian of Delhi and Delhi's monuments. She's written a fabulous trilogy which sort of puts all of Delhi's um, archaeology into historical context and architecture into historical context. And what also struck me in a question I had while reading it is that can archi- you know just as people make the architecture around them can architecture also shape the people who live there like can architecture itself the nature of the architecture shape a society let's take the example of jama masjid i mm. think it does shape even today it's a symbol of uh, you know old delhi that when you had this uh, the, the recent uh, protest marches that you had the bhim army chandrashekhar azad he started it from uh, jama masjid in 1900 and uh, I think 11 or 14, whatever it was, just during the British period, he's asked by the imam to come and deliver a lecture from the member of the Jama Masjid. And Kishilu is given the keys of the Golden Temple and asked to, you know, go there. So this kind of importance and uh, exchange because of the importance of the building. So yes, definitely Jama Masjid is a masjid, it's a mosque and it plays a very important part in the roles of the believers but it's also a symbol of Delhi and that is why it was confiscated after 1857 by the British. It took a long time and a lot of negotiation for them to get it back. So it was seen as a symbol so of course architecture also does shape people and history. And in fact, uh, a quick bit of trivia for my listeners. Swami Shraddhanand, in fact, was also, his name was Munshi Ram. And he was, in fact, given the title of Mahatma before Gandhi himself was. So, in a sense, he was the Mahatma before the Mahatma. And uh, this speech that he gave at the Jama Masjid is considered a great iconic moment because to call a Hindu leader like that to speak at the Jama Masjid was sort of uh, an example of that uh, Hindu-Muslim sort of relationship getting so much better at the time. And this say that when he finished there were you know sounds of Hindu Muslim Ekta Zindabad Mm -hmm. all over the mosque and then in again in 1947 after partition Maulana Abul Kalam Azad speaks to the Muslims from there and tells them not to migrate and he said this is your country so again that is again a very iconic speech where he talks of what India means for the Muslims and why they should stay back here so yes it has shaped it has been a very important part of uh, Delhi and of people's history. So tell me more about the other Delhis, you know, in the sense that, first of all, how many Delhis were there? Because you have also given different versions in your book where you have said maybe there were 14, maybe there were seven. And uh, all I could really register was that, okay, the last two are Shah Jahanabad, which we call Old Delhi and Latians Delhi, which we call New Delhi. And of course, uh, you know, you have Tomar's Delhi, but I don't know where to place that in the numbering. And, uh, uh, you know, so t- take me through the, you know, all the Delhis that are sort of uh, emerging. So the the seven cities of Delhi, I think, is a very romantic idea that's come from the seven cities of Rome. Okay. Okay, because uh, you have this book by Gordon Hearn, which is called The Seven Cities of Delhi. So it's very obviously, you know, inspired by that. But when Sir Sayyid is talking, he talks, and even when Bashiruddin Ahmad is talking, they start with the Prast. So, and they say that, you know, this is a mythological city, because the excavations are still going on to prove it. But there's no proof. Uh, as yet not, but they're still excavating. So, after that, then the first reference that we have that Delhi, that there was a uh, thing, Delhi, is in 200, 250 BC, you have a Ashoka edict. It's a minor edict, but in East of Kailash, you find it. But the fact that no Buddhist text mentions uh, Del- a city called Delhi or Delu or whatever or Delhi or anything resembling the present name means that it wasn't anything much because they are talking of Matra where they are going but they're not talking of this area so the first references we really get are from the Tomars uh, which is uh, 1059 you point out as um, uh, 726 is uh, the time when uh, Tomars mm-hmm. come and Lal Court is settled by Anangpal in the 10th century right. and- something huh you know, and there's an interesting anecdote you share about the Indaprasa times where you talk about how Yudhishthir one day uncovered his food and he found a fly in the food. And he said, enough, you know, this is, I want purity and I don't want this. And then he goes off and lives in the Himalayas. 
and i you know when i read that i just thought of you know the air in delhi today and what you wish it would uh, kind of uh, think of it so what would you date as a first delhi then the, the city established by tomar and then repeopled by tomar uh, lalkot uh, huh. that's the documented history lalkot Do- is yeah documented the first documented city of delhi is lalkot is lalkot and that's you know again uh, aravalli hills because aravalli, strategic huh. reasons and, uh, and all of that then in between like i've given in my first book i've given 14 cities now these cities they were the cities like you have uh, khizrabad and you have various rulers made their uh, capitals ah, and kelokri mm. and all that but they were not as such very big cities they were more of the places of uh, where they lived and places developed around them so a fully developed city as in with its everything of its own are these seven <laughs> and and around what time does delhi become really significant because again you know today we think of delhi as india's capital and oh it's such a great city and all that but as you point out that in the early centuries of the millennium travelers would not even mention delhi if they were traveling through the area they talk about mathura and uh, whatever but delhi never got a mention mathura was seems like the big like cosmopolis of the uh, age around what time does delhi start to become politically significant See, and as a city it grows after the invasion of the of mohammad ghori because even uh, prithviraj chauhan was ruling from ajmer right he gets it from his grandfather he gets delhi the kingdom of delhi from his grandfather anang pal tomar but he is his capital is uh, ajmer so it's only when the delhi sultans come here and they make it their capital and they start expanding uh, from here they expand their kingdom that is when delhi really becomes a important city and then in between of course the moguls they go to agra and then it comes back with uh, shah jahan brings the capital of uh, the empire back to delhi and and you know when you sort of look at the history of delhi as a historian do you watch out for uh, the danger of romanticizing the past you know <laughs> yes uh, you know When I first started writing I had not learned the craft of writing or anything like that I just wrote very you know as it came to me so these are things which I never realized that I'm doing or not doing it's only when the reviews of my first book came out and I was very surprised that oh somebody wants to review my book <laughs> and then then they talked about this it's only after two or three books that I realized that these are the traps that I should not fall into I hadn't been doing it but yes romanticizing is something that comes very naturally to somebody who is looking up to a particular uh, period or a particular place or a particular monument but that is a trap that a historian should not fall into what are the other traps <laughs> of being biased these two things i have to be very careful about not to be biased to try and put everything as carefully as i can and uh, you know like let the reader make their own choices based on whatever evidence that you are giving and the other is of course not to romanticize though that is something that's a little difficult but bias is something which i am very careful about that my own biases should not come into the book i am documenting uh, history so i have to document it as faithfully as i can and that's also complicated isn't it because there's always a trade off i think historians have uh, you know tend to be careful of where on the one hand you want to chronicle faithfully and let the facts speak for themselves but on the other hand if you just chronicle with you know it becomes dry so if you're giving perspective that perspective will necessarily come from you and what you bring so to the so then it should be my opinion it should not be given as a blanket opinion right so the, these are the things that you have to be careful about we must not be judgmental that's another thing that has to be you know because when you are writing about history something which happens it 500 years ago or 1000 years ago we cannot judge them according to today's standards and that is which what something which is happening very often today we say uh, for example say we would judge uh, what prithviraj chauhan did or akbar did or aurangzeb did or ashoka did we can't judge them by what is happening today or by how we behave today they behaved as they did according to the circumstances of the age they lived in and that is why i said this book by richard eaton india in the passionate age is a very good book because it places everything exactly the way it is and how you should look at it how you should look at history in fact that's a dilemma that keeps coming up especially in this modern age where we are so 
quick to pass judgment on uh, the past and this is not even like the old past of babar it's the recent past we we just keep passing uh, judgment based on contemporary values and one of the things i sort of get from reading history is how it humanizes these people for me like uh, you know in ira mukhoti's history for example i learned about you know there's a scene she describes about how when um, the women in babar's family are brought to delhi and he is so excited to meet his wife that he runs out of the mm-hmm. palace barefoot and you know runs out on the street which an emperor is not supposed to do and suddenly this person who is otherwise caricatured as a brutal emperor who demolished temples and all of that and this sort of this uh, human aspect to him and it's interesting that you know when you're writing about sort of you could say in a very dry way that you're writing about architecture you're writing about buildings but you're also writing about people and uh, you know how how did the way that you look at this city change as you started uh, uh, you know delving deeper into it so it's the if i'm looking at a monument that monument had been made by someone so what was the reason for that like say whom i used to for example it's made by his wife it's made by his eldest wife His favorite wife is Hamida Bano Begum, but the tomb is not made by his favorite wife. It's made by his eldest wife, who was also his cousin and with whom he did not really get along well because she was very opinionated and very, you know, like wasn't afraid to speak her mind. So, but it's she who makes the tomb. She who stays there and makes it her life mission to look after it. So that's something very important that you know, like uh, when we think of it today, that we would say, you know, like Hamida Bano is the favorite wife. She is a wife who's very opinionated, who's you know not afraid to speak her mind. so when we think and akbar the son is hamida bano's son so the, he is the ruler so he is the one who is giving the funds or whatever it is that you know it would logically everybody would think it's hamida bano who should be making this tomb but it's not it's haji begum bega begum who is making it so for me that is again a something very interesting that why is it that she is making the tomb and not uh, hamida bano so and there's a lot of confusion at times people that's why i've discussed it in my book that you know it is not hamida bano it is haji begum and haji begum was bega begum who was the eldest wife that is she who's making the two and you know that's so fascinating and even in a say let's say talk about the uh, or qutub uh, minar because that again is something very fascinating that the qutub minar had only four stories and uh, there's a lightning strike and the third one on the top one falls off and when ferosha repairs it he makes one more today's conservationist if they were to do anything like that the heads would roll but when he is doing it he decides okay i must have something here also so he makes two two then he makes it five so these are things which are very fascinating that when you're making the, how the person who's making it is trying to perpetuate his memory also along with looking conserving what is uh, there and the names like this was ma- called mazina or the moezin tower uh, saab they say the qutub minar the word is first used in the 17th 18th century by a british called ensign blunt and uh, the story is that ye qutub saab ki laat hai because a sufi saint is supposed to have a staff which connects him to heaven oh. and because uh, qutub saab is such a important saint for meroli in fact they say ke the name meroli comes from his meher or his blessing so of course he has to have a laat which touches the heavens so qutub uh, minar becomes his laat and this is uh, something people <laughs> uh, people often assume the qutub minar is named after qutubuddin abak but of course is named after uh, khwaja Kutubuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki, and you've also told a delightful story about where the Kaki part of the name comes ah. from. So kindly, uh, kindly tell. So that is a story that you know, like uh, all Sufi saints were, just uh, ko fakirana ek zindagi kehte the. Asli me fakirana zindagi, us tarik ki zindagi jite the. Ke the they would never, especially the Shishti saints would never keep any money for themselves. Even when they got gifts and futu, any kind of gifts, it had to be distributed the same day. So they were always living a hand-to-mouth uh, existence. And uh, Hazrat Bakhtiyar Kaki's wife has to borrow money or to uh, has to be in debt for the uh, we the bread that she's taking. And so <laughs> there are two versions to that. So one is that uh, you know he tells her that you you know I'm not going to give you any more credit. And so Hazrat Bakhtiyar Kaki says that you know it doesn't matter. it will come to you and then of course the bread starts coming appearing every day for them in a shelf so these are his miracles and how the name bakhtiyar comes that uh, ikhtiyar jiska hai so you know like and uh, i am 
you know, very attached to the Khutub Sahib because I feel he had a big role to play in my coming to Delhi. I feel that, you know, I had nothing to do with Delhi. As I said, I, Delhi has adopted me. I never lived here. I wasn't from Delhi. But when I came to Delhi in 2012 and I went to his Dargah, there's something that pulled me to Delhi. And after that, I've been come, I was living in Dubai. My husband was in Dubai. I just packed my bag. He said, okay, you want to go there? You want to write? That's okay. So I packed our luggage, got a container, booked the container. He shifted to a flat. I packed the villa and I came here and shifted here. And then I started living here. Something which I'd always thought that I would never ever live in Delhi or NRC. If we had always thought if we, when we retire, we'd live in Pune because we'd spent 15 years in Pune and where we had a house. And Pune is, of course, a very uh, charming uh, city <laughs> where I uh, studied. Are you then able to articulate what it was about, you know, this that brought you back? No, they, you know? this is something that cannot be put in words because uh, Sufism is in something I'd been, you know, like uh, as a Shia, I've been going to Imam Bada's and to Raza's, which is of the Prophet and his, the Imams, the Hazrat Ali and his uh, children. I've been going to that since childhood. I visited almost all the Rozas in Iran, Iraq, Syria and uh, Saudi Arabia and in India. And uh, so that was something I've been doing. But Sufism wasn't something that I was connected to, though Hazrat Ali is said to be the first Sufi. So for me, you know, like it was more as a, you know, the Shia part of it rather than the Sufism part of it that it was something that I'd been connected to. So it's only when I came in 2012, I started going on walks with uh, Asif Dehelvi, who runs Delhi Karwan. So he lives in Mehroli, and he is the one who started talking to me about Sufism. And he took me to Qutub Sahib Targa. And just something there that, you know, then drew me to Sufism. And today I like, to, of course, I can't say I'm a Sufi because that is a very long journey. But there's something about Sufism that attracts me. The simplicity of that. And I feel it's a natural corollary of, since I'm a great believer of Hazrat Ali, that Hazrat Ali and Sufis all take, as I said, they take their chart, their descent from Hazrat Ali. So I feel that it's a very natural journey for, for me to be able to coming from from Ali to the Sufis of Delhi. To, so there's something about it. I can't explain it, but I feel that it is Qutub Sahib who asked me to stay in Delhi and to, you know, write about uh, Delhi. And you also mentioned that you started learning Urdu again, rediscovering Urdu as it were. And, and so through this process of sort of... Um, figuring out the history of Delhi and you're also obviously reading a lot of Urdu sources at this time, you're translating these Urdu books on uh, uh, Delhi. Did that sort of deepen your appreciation for uh, Urdu literature and um, uh, the, uh, culture? And Yes. Uh, I, I, and also, is there a sort of Urdu renaissance happening? Like, I also see Rekta happening and more and more people are getting interested the in it. The renaissance that's happening in Urdu is only in the spoken language and the poetry. Okay. It's not happening in the script. I see. Because people who do want to speak, see, we've always spoken in North India, we've spoken in Hindustani, exactly. which is a, a soft, um, the, a, so, the saying, uh, a version of Urdu itself, uh, using a lot of Persian and Hindi words in it. Khadi boli ke jalafs hote. But uh, script, very few people know, and uh, the script is dying. And when the script dies, the literature and the history dies. And another thing. So, that in that sense, I would not say it's a renaissance because, further, a, a language isn't only about poetry. A language is about, of course, a lot of the literature is again translated into English, but then you lose the nuance. You lose the nuance. And what about the history that's written in that? As I said, there's so much of history in that language. There's, and there are so many dialects. We are losing the dialects. We are losing. Urdu on a daily basis. So the Rekhta is also only promoting the poetry. The biggest uh, service that Rekhta is doing into my mind is that they have digitalized all the old Urdu text. So they are there, but then you have to know the script to be able to read them. So of course they're there for scholars, but the common person has, and they're running classes also, but it's, uh, you know, as a language, unless you know the script, the language is uh, <laughs> in danger. 
And, and one question that's always struck me when I've read something translated from one language to another when I happen to understand both of them. You know, is translation even possible? It seems to me that uh, languages are fundamentally so different from each other that in a sense you are having to recreate the essence of something. You can't just translate word to word. What was your process of learning how to translate like? Uh, as I said again, I started translating without giving much thought to it. And the first book that I translated was Dahtane Qadar. And uh, that is again a very interesting story. I was reading the last Mughal by Dalrymple and he says that there's this book called Dahtane Qadar and I'm surprised nobody's translated it. I said, okay, let me try that. So I took the book and I started. So the first thing was to get a copy of it because I didn't have a very good uh, print over here in uh, couldn't find a very good print of it in Delhi. So anyway, I was in Dubai so I could get a print from uh, uh, Pakistan that I got one from Raza Library. So I started with that. Now, I think there was recently a debate on uh, Fezka. Hum dekhen. Hum dekhen. So on that also is something that I was talking, I mentioned that in a couple of my tweets and something that I've written, that any language, any literature depends heavily on the religious iconography of the language that it's writing on. Say, for example, P.G. Woodhouse. I'm a big P.G. Woodhouse fan. But when you reach P.G. Woodhouse, if you do not know your Bible, if you do not know your hymns, you will not understand. Or the Psalms, you don't understand half of what he's writing. You know, like he'll keep referring as pants the heart when heated in the chase. Now, that's a hymn. So you have to know all that to be able to understand what he's talking about. So we don't call, uh, you know, these are references which you've grown up with. So similarly, when you're translating from the language, Sufra Urdu, so though Urdu, I was still work in progress, but the culture was something I was very invested in. I knew everything about that, uh, the culture and the language and the religion. So that was the biggest challenge was how to translate that. Like in one place, uh, the the Helvi writes, Suraj Savane Zepa Savarta. Now, the, in the, one of the descriptions of doomsday is that the sun will be yard and a quarter above your head. Uh, so you have to know that to get, get <laughs> So the... when you're writing that, so when you're describing it, unless you know the reference. Now, somebody who doesn't know the Quranic reference to how Doomsday is described, and that is what is there in one of Fez's poem, he describes it exactly like the way it's given in the Quran, okay, you know, the fluffs of uh, the saying and uh, what's going to happen on Doomsday. So when you're invested in, in that language, in the culture and the religion, you're able to use that iconography. So that whichever language, whichever writer you're doing it. So when you're doing it, translation, for me, it's not how good you are in uh, the language itself. It's how good you understand, how well you understand the nuances. Like uh, one very interesting anecdote. I did a lot of reading for uh, translating Dastane Qadar to understand what he's trying to do because I've given a lot of notes in that so that people understand what is happening because he's writing it and at times it's erratic and so that, you know, you understand completely what he's writing and I wanted that to be there instead of just translation. So there in one place he mentions ke, when he's talking of ke, yahan ki paltan aagai, yahan ki paltan aagai, and all these platoons and regiments from all over the place are coming to Delhi to fight against the British. So he says, Safar Meena ki paltan aagai. Now I kept looking every at all the maps everywhere. I asked people, I said, Boy, where is the Safar Meena? Nobody could tell me, but there's no place called Safar Meena. So then finally I had a whole lot of questions uh, which I marked and for me, any questions I have in Urdu, I go to Professor Shamsur Rahman Faruqi. So he was coming to Delhi. He told me, so whatever you have, you just bring all your questions to me and we'll sit and discuss them. This was before it was the final edit. So I took it to him. And then, of course, he told me this, this, this. And then I asked him, I said, sir, Safar Meena kaha pe hai? So he started laughing. He said, that's sappers and miners. <laughs> 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 so that because he and he told me he said you know even I have wondered where it was but then because he had read somewhere and he could correlate that you know sappers and miners had come there and so he had read it in some other book somewhere and then uh, recently somebody else told me that in Bengal there was a sapper and miner regiment and that place was called Safarmina. So, you know, this is how, so, that is why it's so difficult at times. If This is a very simple thing. I could have written Safar Meena there, but then it wouldn't have, uh, you know, the reader wouldn't have understood what is this Safar Meena. They would have also wondered like me, Safar Meena hai kidar? 
you know things like this when you're translating like uh, when i was translating asaru sanadid now asaru sanadid uh, i for the is in two uh, editions there are two editions of it the first edition is written in 1846 and the second one is in 1854 and uh, the first one is written when he writes he writes uh, sir sayed writes it in a very persianized style the second one is of course very it's a simple urdu one so i started when i did it because i was using it for my uh, my own work when i was just writing the delhi trilogy so i was referring to the second uh, edition only and i had translated most of it uh, for my own notes and uh, then i said okay why not you know translate this uh, book and then uh, while i was translating that i came to know that there is another edition and that's much more interesting so that had all the anecdotes and all the spicy stories and everything so then i hunted for that uh, i got a copy of that and uh, the monuments or something which are very easy for me because i had visited all the monuments that he talks about the 130 monuments i knew them inside out so when whatever he's talking about i could understand what he's saying but then there is a chapter in that which is delhi or delhi ke log now that chapter is <laughs> supposed to be one of the most important chapters of that book which he hasn't included in the second edition now this chapter was very very personalized urdu and in that he talks about uh, he gives each and every person that he he gives them titles alqab hote hai usme now those were you know they would they just sailed over my head so i had a uh, mufti sahab who would help me with uh, the persian part of it because he knew persian and arabic so i called him and i said ke whenever i had a problem with persian and arabic i would call him so he came and i said ke aap isko padhiye ab he started reading and you know there is no punctuation mark in the book so it was a xerox of that time i hadn't even got a you know a fresh copy so we just could not figure out what are they saying where does one title end where does the second end so uh, then i started sending it taking you know screenshots sending it to various people and we were still not i was still not satisfied with what the answer that i was getting then there one of my friends she's a poet uh, azra naqvi I went to her one day and I said, "Azra, pa, can you please understand that?" So she sat and she said, "Reading." And then suddenly she said, "She said, you know, this is in verse." Wow! So when she got the verse, is when we were able to separate it. And so then she we, got all the breaks, ha, basically. Ha. So we could then mm-hmm. sp- uh, separate that. Okay, this title ends here. This one starts here. The, so after that, it became easy. And then when I told that to my mufti sir, then he said, he said, you know, and that he'd already told me. He said one line is in Arabic, and the same thing is said in Persian. And it was obviously a very, very hyperbolic kind of uh, language that was used. So that was very difficult. And whereas the part on the monuments took me, say, two years to do it, because I wasn't doing it full time. I was writing my book and doing this. But this part I did dedicated only to that. It took me over a year. Those hundred pages. Wow. <laughs> and that, and then also I had to leave out a lot of portions because the when he's talking about the poets and the ulemas, he gives their Persian and Arabic qasidas and the whatever. So, since I don't know Persian, and I was translating it from a historical point of view. So I kept only the biographies and whatever I thought was important for a student of history to know. And I've left a note in my introduction that I hope one day some. Persian or Arabic scholar will translate the whole thing of this chapter because I'm sure the qasidas and the description that whoever wrote would be very very interesting. And in all your studies, when you're reading all these really old uh, uh, documents, are there enough of them for you to then get a sense of the evolution of the language through the centuries? That in you... this book itself, the first book to the second book, the Persianized Urdu, the Persianized to simple Urdu. Urdu. <laughs> wow. so from uh one person <laughs> so okay so my next question is a slightly um complex one in the sense that today you know there are so many debates about the idea of india right but the india itself is relatively recent now through your history of studying all the many different delis that have come up you have also come across i i don't know what's a phrase for it i can't call it the many ideas of delhi but sort of the many ideas of us as seen from delhi you know the many ideas of whoever lives in delhi of what what they are what the society is like 
you know so is it possible to say that there are sort of different ideologies and philosophies of the state and so on evolving through these centuries or is it like very binary in the sense of okay we are now the kings we will destroy everything else we will do our own thing or is there something much more subtle and complex and uh, assimilative happening there something much more subtle and assimilative we have on the one hand we do have the kings who are destroying and who are rebuilding but on the other hand we have a darga of hazrat zamudin where basant is being celebrated as i said we have a mughal king who is offering a chadar at a temple in mehroli and saying that if i can't go to the uh, temple i will not go to the mandir you have uh, holi diwali rakhi being celebrated inside the red fort and uh, there is a documented proof that muhammad bin tughlaq was celebrating holi ibn batuta i think talks of it so you have all this and you have uh, so you know like it's it's so complex it's you know like when you talk of one period or you talk of one ruler there are so many facets to it like now one of my favorite stories again is uh, muhammad bin tughlaq he was a, a tyrant uh, he is supposed to be an eccentric genius he had so many of these master strokes that over the change of capital the currency you know etc etc and uh, in between a lot of people died so when his cousin firoz shah tughlaq ascends the throne what he does is that he was very fond of his cousin obviously and he never thought he'd be the king now he becomes the king so he gets searches for all the descendants of the people that muhammad bin tughlaq had killed and that's a story that's documented and i think uh, sir sayed and uh, bashir ahmed both have uh, documented i've mentioned the who have documented it in the book i keep getting so much of information overload that i forget who's documented what so he then gets these mafi namas from them from the descendants and he buries them next to the grave of mohammed bin tughlaq ke ho sakta hai isse iski maghfirat ho jaye and god may forgive him wow oh, okay <laughs> i thought he out of remorse he contacted them to make their lives better in some way but no he wanted the mafi now for his uh, <laughs> so that is so you know so this is how things happened then so he's getting that uh, whether he didn't make their life better or not i don't know he may have but uh, because he ruled for 50 years and he was supposed to be a good king but uh, this is how so you know th- on one hand you have that on the other hand you have that mohammed bin tughlaq also built uh, the satpula which is an irrigation system so that the farmers could have uh, you know water easy water so all this is also happening and uh, he was a very uh, devoted devotee of hazrat nizamuddin ali in fact he is one of the few people who jinko kehte na ki janaze ko kandha diya tha so he held his uh, beer on in, in his funeral so he had that aspect to him also he was very cruel also so you have all this so every ruler has many aspects to it and the people who are living also have obviously different and the other the thing is that this is sahir lodhiyan vi ne kaha taj mahal ke upar jo unki bahut mashhoor nazm hai na ki when we talk of taj mahal and today is uh, valentines day so we talk of taj mahal we talk of uh, mumtaz mahal and shah jahan of their love for the each other and uh, sahir lodhiyan vi says mere mehboob kahin aur mila kar mujhse He says, उन्होंने भी तो मोहब्बत की होगी जिनकी सिन्नाई ने बख्शा इसे अक्स जमील जिनके रोजे रहे बे नाम उन्हें शान जिनपे जलाई ना किसी ने कंदील के द आर्टिज मस्ट ऑल्सो हैव वर्क दो ग्रेव अनोन नो बडी सो there are so many levels so many aspects and we can just keep on talking about the people who lived here they are nameless they we don't even know where they are buried they dead and gone the people who actually built the cities we don't know about them now we do know the architects of shah jahanabad they have mohallas named after them ustad hira ustad lahori there are mohallas in there or areas in shah jahanabad which are named after them but what about the people we don't know them what about the people who live there we don't know much about them we know the areas we know ke ek pai wala hai na pai wala was because the they sold bedsteads aur jahez ke liye jo palang khareede jate the wo wahan se khareede jate the kinari bazaar and dariba were the places where wedding shopping was done who were the people who got married who were the people who had happy marriages or whatever it is these are things we have no idea about so we you know history is uh, as they say written only from one point of view at time 
and uh, in fact that's what my next question was going to be about but before we go there let me point out to my listeners we are recording this on feb 14th which shows our dedication to our work that uh, rana ji has come all the way from greater noida to housecast to talk about uh, uh, history with me and here i am recording in a studio far from home and like you pointed out you know in the 20th century and in the 19th century even it, it's very easy relatively easy to get a sense of the lives that common people lived but earlier centuries as you said a lot of the history is written from the point of view of the court and the rulers and whatever and some of it in fact is actually court history and you have to then dig deeper to find other reliable histories but we don't really get a sense of how the common people lived and all, the history of all of these delis that you've written about also is not just a history of the tombs of these noble men and these great monuments that they built but like how much harder is it to then uh, Uh, understand uh, the lives of the common people and how they lived and where they lived so th- these descriptions come only from those very sm- short stories that are given of uh, there are a lot of these urdu books but written after the fall of uh, the mughal empire like there's this book called uh, delhi ki Ch- ajeeb shakhsiyat delhi ki chand shakhsiyat now they talk about a kebab chi called ghumi kebabi and ghumi used to be a cook in the mughal uh, kitchen and he comes on to the roads after 1857 and he opens up his stalls and how he is very particular about that you whoever comes has to be in line he will only serve people as per the uh, you know time that they've come and how he you know serves and how he talks and so and there was a time when indians knew how to queue up <laughs> and uh, today when i you know there is uh, a favorite <laughs> kebab wala of mine which i go to in matia mahal and that is the same area where ghumi would have sat and again that babu bhai also does not you know like people have to queue up there you may be you may you know like you may be as sophisticated as uh, somebody or you may be just a ordinary worker or a laborer he does not differentiate he will give you only as per the time that you've come there and g- given the order so i love that about him and uh, the fact that he you know like he's so very egalitarian about his approach of whom he's serving and how he's serving and if there is a big rush he will not talk to you he there's no time for chit chat like once i was doing <laughs> i was uh, you know like scouting around for a food show and i wanted to showcase him and i went to him and he said see i don't have time for all this i said you know i said you will be on tv you will be shown all over the world he said mujhe farak nahi padta mere paas bahut kaam hai mere paas waqt nahi hai so you know, there are these kind of characters also but uh, who are there who are part who make a city but they uh, like i try to document as much that there the machli wala who sits next to him and he sells fried fish i have not eaten his fried fish actually but i have spent a long time talking to him because uh, he likes to chat so i asked him once i said he said i'm a third generation or a fourth generation uh, uh, this thing sitting here and selling so i said okay when everybody because that area a lot of people migrated to pakistan i said why didn't you go and he said hamare buzurgon ne kaha ke jamuna kaise jayegi hamare sath jama masjid kaise जाएगा कुतुब मीनार कैसे जाएगा हमारे साथ तो हम कैसे चले जाए Oh, that's beautiful. So, so you you get you know, a sense so, of. So uh, these are stories which I've documented. I find it so fascinating to talk to these people that they are the ones who actually are the. They go get it, na? That यहाँ की मिट्टी ये है. They are the ones who hold us all together. And and you know one of the sort of disturbing things about the current times, very disturbing things, is this sort of. caricaturish view of the indian muslim which is being spread by the current political dispensation mostly by people who've never had muslim friends or interacted with muslims in any way but it's a very caricatured view where it is assumed that all muslims are necessarily radicalized and they are somehow conflated with pakistan as if there is you know something that wrong with pakistan to begin with you know and and is this sort of something that has just of this century i mean through the centuries has there been sort of this kind of caricaturish view of the indian muslim this kind of because you know when one looks at the sweep of history it seems very clear that everything is very syncretic and sure you have all this violence which is political violence which is happening at the level of the ruler destroying things and building things or whatever but how has society been in all this time see this thing started after 1857 uh the first war of indian independence as it's been called i prefer to call it the uprising because all of india did not participate in it so when the uprising of 1857 took place it was termed by the british as a mohammedan conspiracy 
and it's after that that they went after the muslims because for them it was the muslims who rose against them although that is not a fact it was uh, across sure across of, yeah. religion across religion people who went against him and if you had uh, hadrat mahal you also had uh, lakshmi bai then you had kumar singh if you had azimullah khan you had kumar singh you had in delhi itself you had so many people and uh, the saying vallabhgarh ke jo raja nahar the you had lot of people who were even punished and who were executed afterwards so that's not a fact but the thing is that that is what they saw because the head of what they call the rebels the gadar was bahadur shah zafar they had around him whom they exiled so they confirmed it a mohammedan conspiracy so after that and they also went after the ruling class and the zamindars and that, that is when the actual demonization starts and there's a building here which i have mentioned in my book also there's a building here on the ridge uh, near the university called the mutiny memorial it was put up i think in 1864 on that they give a timeline of uh, the siege of delhi and they write on the 14th of september 1857 uh, kashmiri gate is breached then they talk of 17th september the king flees the fort and then 20th they say they have captured the red fort and then they say 21st september the city is emptied of the enemy now when you read dastan e ghadar you know that the enemy that is emptying and the enemy that's running away are the muslim noble or the land owners or the whoever it is who are running away from them and then just below that you have a plaque written by the indian government i think in when 100 years of 1857 were being celebrated where they say that the term enemy refers to patriots so it's there they started that is how it was perceived and for so many years they were not allowed the muslims were not allowed to come back to shah jahanabad and ghalib documents that in the stanbu when he's talking about that so does of course zahir dehlvi zahir dehlvi talks about it how he had to he went to alwar then jaipur and all over the place and then finally he goes to rampur from rampur then he gets a mafi nama and he's allowed to come back only i think as later 1864 he comes back to delhi because us time pe ek delhi darbar hone wala tha and then they gave a general mafi nama to the muslim and say okay you can come back but they do not come back into their old positions and then there is this book called Begmat Ke Asu written by Khwaja Hassan Nizami which talks of the whatever befell the Mughal prince and princesses where they are now begging on the streets and there is again a book uh, which has taken the story is also written in Begmat Ke Asu uh, by Ahmed Ali there is a book called Twilight of Delhi where he talks of ke darbar ho raha hai and the king is going out on an elephant and there is this man on a wooden a cripple on a wooden cart who is physically challenged person on a wooden cart who is begging and it turns out that he is a mughal prince so you know these are things which uh, were very much happened after and then 1811 uh, now this demonization of the muslims started not just in 1857 it happens much before that it happens when james mills writes the history of british india when he writes that in 1811 he had never come to india he did not come to india even during or after writing it he classifies it as hindu muslim and british period now he talks of the hindu period as the golden period muslim is now the barbaric period and the british period are the saviors and then you have this eliot and dawson where said they where they it gives in the preface itself they say that we they want to talk about how the uh, the people of india have been saved by the british so this is a very systematic thing that happened then of, during the national movement and afterwards then this whole thing there was a lot of attempt to finish that gandhi ji tried very hard and and as i always keep saying i said i grew up in nehru's india when we did not have this difference of a hindu and a muslim i never ever felt i was a muslim of course i am a practicing muslim i pray do my prayers five times a day whatever i do i did that at home it was never something i wore on my sleeve but past four or five years there's never a day when i'm not reminded that i am a muslim before that my only identity was that i am an indian and you know with the british it was obviously the dual imperative of one divide and rule so it's a strategic thing that you're doing that and two also uh, you know it was a simple narrative which kind of explained a very complex country so they went along with it that you have hindu period muslim period and so on now the thing is looking back in history uh, you know i'll 
just to declare my bias straight away, it is obviously tempting for me to look at history and look at our syncretism and look at our society and say that, uh, you know, Hindus and Muslims have always lived in peace side by side. But equally, you can cherry pick evidence and come to the conclusion that there have always been sort of darare between the two, you know, and a lot of how uh, an outsider or layman like me would look at this history is I would look it through the lens of my own bias, uh, as I stated. For something like this, which is obviously such an emotive subject and which obviously has so much resonance with our current lives and the world that we live in, how do you negotiate this sort of history and do you feel that there is sort of a clear narrative and the divisions that are there today are perhaps sharper than, uh, you know, I mean, obviously we've had incredibly sharp divisions during the troubled times of partition and the years before and so on. But if you look through the centuries-old history of Delhi, are these relatively new? The divisions were between the rulers and the ruled. They were not religious differences. It was, you know, the oppression was there, but it was of the ruler. It wasn't seen as, you know, that, uh, okay, he's a Muslim, he's oppressing me, or he's a Hindu, he's oppressing me. And that was Nehru's point of view as well, in fact, that a lot of communal differences aren't yes. really religious differences. And uh, if you see the history of communal rights, there were only five communal rights during the Mughal rule, that also after the 18th century, out of which the first was in Ahmedabad. And after that, you've after independence, and here even during the time of Nehru, you've had many during the Congress rule. Also, you've had so many uh, communal rights, and of course now you have open division. I will, uh, you know, like I normally am very guarded about what I say because I try to always look on the optimistic side of it. But there is no doubt that there is an all-out attempt now to create a division, that otherization is happening and to create the other you have to make a caricature out of the other you demonize and you dehumanize demonize, huh? and uh, a person like me who keeps you know like who fits in well into every kind of this thing so I do not fit into the narrative of either the right wing Hindu or the right wing Muslim and I am trolled and I am abused by everybody so I am called a kafir by the Muslims and I am called a Buddha parast and a jihadi by the Hindus so you know this otherization is that bad that anybody who talks of uh, syncretism is uh, considered you know a person a non grata in these days because that is what is standing in the way both of them uh, they say of course the uh, the muslim right wing is now a, a day is very i should say is not very empowered because the way that it, i'm talking of say a few years ago uh, today of course they have been very restrained in their uh, responses and it has been taken over as the, just now in shahin bag where this uh, although that news turned out to be false but initially when there was this report that the deobandi uh, from some clerics from deobanda saying that you know the shahin bag protest should stop and this lady said ke hum to samvidhan ke liye lad rahe hain hum mazhab ke liye thodi lad rahe hain ke hum aapki baat sunein so the narrative has changed people have taken over and they've taken over from the religious leaders and they're trying to chart their own destiny. But I'm just saying that, you know, this otherization was happening for a very long time. Today, it's happening from the Hindu right wing. It's happening very, very, it's very fast. Like, uh, how should I say it? It's very fast. बहुत तेजी से हो रहा है जो पहले इतने हल्के हल्के हो रहा था आज बहुत तेजी से हो रहा है दिस अदराइजेशन ऑफ कैरेक्टराइजेशन के यू रिकॉग्नाइज देम बाय द क्लोथ्स या एग्जैक्टली सो हाउ डू यू रिकॉग्नाइज देम बाय द क्लोथ्स हाउ डू यू रिकॉग्नाइज मी बाय माय क्लोथ्स एंड इवन द डिमोनाइजेशन ऑफ बिरयानी एंड यू नो जस्ट लाइक द माय फेवरेट फूड सो मतलब या सो आई कीप सेइंग आई सेइंग द मुगल फेवरेट फूड वाज खिचड़ी दे डिड नॉट ईट बिरयानी द वर्ड बिरयानी वाज नॉट इवन कॉइन देन the Mughals did not eat biryani. Biryani comes much later in the late 18th and 19th century. And these people would not be wearing the clothes they wear if the Mughals hadn't come here. Where do you think <laughs> Modi ji's churidar kurta comes <laughs> from? <laughs> India. So, did... pajama itself is yeah. brought by them, the jama. So, you can, but if you see Nuskhai Shah Jahani, which has been translated by Mrs. Salma Hussain as, uh, I think, the Emperor's Table. 
शाहजहां वॉज वेरी फॉन्ड ऑफ चलाई का साग बैगन का भुरता आलू का भुरता ही रीटिंग दर्ड बिरयानी देन वॉज कॉल जेर ए बिरिया एंड ही रीटिंग पनीर का जेर ए बिरिया सो ऑल दीज थिंग बट दे नेवर एट द बिरयानी एंड मीट दैट वी थिंक दैट दे डेड दे वर वेरी फॉन्ड ऑफ खिचड़ी एंड दे वर वेजिटेरियन ऑन मेनी डेज ऑफ द वीक सो औरंगजेब वॉज टोटली वेजिटेरियन Yeah, as was Hitler. <laughs> But you know, paneer biryani. Frankly, I must draw a line, and here I will be judgmental about the past. That paneer biryani, who eats it? But you know, and and would you also say? And again, I don't want to be guilty myself of romanticizing what's happening. But would you also say that what Shaheen Bagh represents, for example, is a combination of the best of all the centuries of Delhi in terms of people coming together? Uh, in spite of their diversity and their differences and also a combination of that with this modern india where we have this liberal constitution and and we want to live by sort of these values and this idea of india or am i romanticizing it too much or do you see you know while all this othering which makes you despair is going on do you also see no, some hope? i think what has happened in shahin bagh happened very spontaneously and it's just become such a beautiful movement of uh, inclusiveness of you know and because it's controlled by the women i think it has that certain touch to it where that harshness is not there and uh, it's just beautiful the way they are doing it the way they embrace everybody and i've gone there a couple of times the way the inclusiveness of including everybody and how everybody is coming and being you know like uh, uh, joining with them across religion so it's nothing to do with now it is of course it, it is their identity which is uh, at stake and when you go there, there there is no doubt that the maximum number of things that you see the most of the people that you see will be wearing scarves and hijabs but uh, it's you know you don't that's not the thing that comes to your mind they are wearing hijabs or whatever but you do not see them as muslims you see them as women who are sitting there very strong women who are sitting there protesting against something which is a constitutional right so i do see that even i romanticize it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it is something which is uh, just spread all over and uh, when i was once i was talking to them and i was telling them i said you know that this is the continuation of sultan razia after all uh, razia also stood up for her rights and stood up for her people and she stood up out to the the chehelgani who were trying to oust her and her father did say that uh, she is equal to 20 of my sons so in delhi and then you had jahan ara you had zebun nisa you had a long list of women who have been strong and if we take it if we do take even uh, in the process having been here at some point of time then you have the ropadi <laughs> yeah and so, and that's also interesting you know when you look back at indian mythology for example and you look at the stark contrast between draupadi and sita and sita almost seems to represent the ideal indian woman as per you know the uh, the the dominant political view today would have it where she is subservient to her husband and she's all of that and draupadi is incredibly rebellious and badass and independent and whatever which kind of shows you that it's you know indian sanskar is not so simple to pin down it's got all these different strands you know even within hinduism also like i think the whole of india watched ramayan and mahabharat very religiously there was not a single episode i missed and mahabharat i must have watched multiple times because i used to love the dialogue especially of shri krishn so the but uh, recently i think it's 3 years or 4 years now that when amish's book came out on sita so there the sita is very different from this sita okay his sita is a warrior she is in fact the defense uh, minister of mithila and she is a warrior and she is the vishnu Well, that's so when i read that you know it opened a whole new world of sita to me yes she does accompany her husband but she is the vishnu and then she marries uh, ram and then ram also becomes a vishnu but it is she who is a very strong character and uh, it's a wonderful book i really love that when they show sita as somebody a very very strong character not as the submissive character that we were seen uh, that i we saw in uh, the tv serial so there are supposed to be a lot of uh, versions of ramayan there are i think 300 versions or something like that many versions yeah huh. so every version is written from a different and uh, i had met amish uh, while he was writing it and he said that he is consulting a version that has sita as the main 
the character in it. That's remarkable, and I've just realized that I've taken up almost two hours of your time. So, but before we go, tell me a little bit about uh, you know what are you working on now? You know, you you've done these books on Delhi, you've translated uh, uh, these books. What what keeps you going? What's your next project? How do you what do you look forward to when you wake up in the morning? <laughs> I'm working on three projects at the moment. Wow. Uh, one is a book and uh, two uh, projects. Uh, I normally don't like talking in advance. I'm a little <laughs> superstitious, let's put it, about my work. Yeah. But uh, the one project that has already, it's finished and about to come is a app uh, which I have done on uh, for a group called Restbird, uh, which they were outsourced by ASI. Uh, it's on monuments. It's uh, where you can uh, read and hear about it. So there's a podcast cast and there are different descriptions. I've curated 12 monuments for them on that. So that is something that I'm very uh, I worked on the whole of last year. I visited these 12 monuments and I did that. And there are two other projects I'm working on. <laughs> One is the two are books and there's a third, yes. And there's a third which is another thing that I'm working on. Hopefully by me uh, there should be more clarity. <laughs> Cannot wait. And and uh, before you go, I'd like you to ask, like my, my listeners always keep uh, saying that they discover so many books through the podcast and they love it when my guests recommend books that they absolutely should read. So before, without tying you down to a subject like Delhi or whatever, just recommend three books that you think everybody should read. And you can't include your own books because I am recommending those. I think they're absolutely amazing. So one book is Richard Eaton, India and the Persian Heritage. That definitely everybody should read. And the second book is uh, Manu Pillay's <laughs> uh, Rebel Sultans. Rebel Sultans, yeah. <laughs> and third is Ira Mukhorti's. I'll give you four. Hmm. And third is Ira Mukhorti's uh, Daughters of the Sun. And fourth is Mani Mukda's Allahu Akbar. That's fantastic because I've already done episodes with uh, <laughs> Manu and uh, Ira and I am doing an episode next week with Mani Mukda. So I feel like I've covered much of the uh, material. I shall definitely pick up that Richard Eaton book. Uh, Rana, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and more power to all the work that you do in future. Thank you. I hope it turned out also the way you wanted it to. No, no, it's great. And my listeners will uh, tell you that on Twitter that this was such a fun episode. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, do follow the links in the show notes and go to your nearest online bookstore and just buy all of Rana Safi's book, especially if you're uh, fascinated by Delhi, but even if you're not. You can follow Rana on Twitter at I am Rana, I A M and her name Rana. And it should be noted that she took this handle long before that copycat Shah Rukh Khan took the handle I am SRK. That is not original. I am Rana is the original at I am Rana. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Verma, A M. M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen.in and thinkpragati.com. Thank you for listening and hey, don't stay at home after listening to this episode. Go out, look at the city around you. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you. <laughs>